But when I'm at home saying I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be addicted to my phone anymore, it's not just me against my phone. It's me against departments of people who are trained to keep me on there. That's a huge challenge to overcome, but being aware of it is critical. All right. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Great to have you. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Well, Johnny and I thoroughly enjoyed your book, and I'm very curious for you to define what a peacemaker is and why it's so important in today's world. Yes, I think a peacemaker, I define a peacemaker as someone who can have productive discourse about hard topics. And I think in our world today, especially with social media doing so much to put us in echo chambers and make communication difficult, people need to be peacemakers more than ever. So we've got a lot of hard topics to discuss and we need people who can talk about them in a productive way. And how did those skills become a part of your repertoire in your career? It's a good question. I wish I could tell you I I knew at first. I mean, that's part of what led me to want to write this book was that I I noticed in my circles, I, uh, you know, as a law professor that studies the First Amendment, I would spend my days talking about all of the most controversial topics you can imagine, and I do it with people who are able to have productive discourse about it. And it started getting me wondering, what are we doing? What are the habits that people are engaging in that make this possible? And so for me, I think it's something that somewhat natural and something that developed over time uh, by being in this field and being around people who had expectations of productive discourse. Uh, But what I also know is that anybody can learn it. You know, these are habits that anybody can employ. Yeah. And looking at that, how should our listeners approach these habits and becoming peacemakers themselves? Well, it's just like anything, trying to establish a habit, right? Trying to do something every single day that then becomes part of your life that you're no longer thinking about. I think we have a huge problem, though, which is most technology and social media is is designed to f- to become habit forming. That's what that's how an, that's how an app becomes wildly successful, right? Is it, it gets us to create lots of habits. Many of those habits uh, actually are the opposite of being productive in our discourse. So we're fighting against a very big and well-educated and intelligent machine that's trying to get us to engage in the opposite of the types of habits I'm talking about in my book. So uh, that is a challenge, but it is becoming aware of our daily routines and then thinking through these habits and how we can incorporate them each day. I'd rather use the word social engineering than habit building because I feel that the habits that they're uh, having us build are antithetical to a a happy life, which is connection and and those things. There is nothing in social media that's showing me that things are going to get better. So these skills need to be built up and we need to be aware that these social media platforms are destroying those lines of communication so that we can continue to make sure that they stay open. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, you know, I speak, I speak all over North America about, about these issues. And I find myself repeatedly educating people on just how sophisticated these social media companies are on keeping people addicted to their platforms. And it's not, it's not some high level conspiracy. I mean, they're not hiding it. It's open, right? They, they have, they have teams. Very honest about it. <laughs> yes, they have, they have teams of psychologists and mathematicians and computer programmers who know, you know, PhDs in psychology who know how to keep people addicted and they're employing that. So when I'm at home think, saying, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be addicted to my phone anymore, it's not just me against my phone. It's me against departments of people who are trained to keep me on there. That's a huge challenge to overcome, but being aware of it is critical. Being aware that that's what's happening is critical. There was something that came to light a few weeks ago, and, and, and I just equated it to this very problem, which is the cigarette companies and the, and the lab coats that were paid to figure out how to make cigarettes as addictive as possible were then brought into the processed foods industry to do that same job. And we have the food that we have today due to that arrangement. And you can look around the world and and, uh, look around America and judge for yourself of whether that was a good or bad thing. I'll let the audience decide that. But if they're willing to do that with our food, what do you think they're willing to do with our technology? It's interesting you make the analogy to tobacco to food because what we have with social media is from the gambling industry to social media. So much of what the social media companies use there you go. are techniques that the gambling industry perfected. And in particular, a variable reward system 
right? Like when somebody likes us on social media, we get a hundred likes. We don't get those immediately as they come in. There is a there is a mathematical formula that delivers those likes to us at the exact perfect pace to keep us addicted, just like the gambling industry keeps you on a slot machine with wins at the exact perfect pace. And they have a mathematical formula for it where they know exactly what to do for our brains to stay addicted, right? So it's a really good analogy. The difference is... Uh, there is no First Amendment or constitutional provision that clearly protects something like the tobacco industries or the food industries. So you can get a lot more regulation there. Uh, we, As a First Amendment expert, I can tell you it's much harder to figure out how to regulate social media companies. They're arguably doing engaging in something that's just as destructive. But how do we regulate them in a way that's consistent with the First Amendment is not clear. We have not solved that yet. And uh, and people like me are spending a lot of time thinking about it. How do we pull that off? We're trying to figure that out. Well, part of the addictive nature of social media, I feel, is the opposite of peacemaking. It is supercharging the discourse in a way that we don't trust the other side. We feel like everything is a conflict and conflict drives the clicks, the views, the likes, the consumption that creates the addiction. So as a peacemaker, how are you engaging with social media and, and what do you do to wall yourself off from that temptation? Yeah, so part of one of my, one of my early habits, I, I, habit number two is I talk about engaging in real learning about our world. And that means really, quite frankly, breaking free from social media. Whatever positives we think we're getting out of it, I think the negatives are far greater. And so how can you use it effectively, you know? One thing you can do is if you're engaging and trying to engage in real learning about our world, part of that means, uh, for example, always hunting for two different news sources with different biases about any given story you might be wanting to learn about. And you can use social media effectively to do that, not to take what the algorithm feeds you, but to go find two people with different biases on social media who are linking to news stories and then using them as using it as a tool to get to those news stories. But, you know, look, you got to be very careful because you wade into those waters and very quickly they start snagging you and you're reading all sorts of crap you never intended to read. You know, I recommend for some people, if you if you can't do it that way, if you can't use it where you're using it as a tool for yourself and you find yourself getting sucked into it, far better to set it aside and and do research short of social media. I had a great conversation with a crowd in Canada recently where we were talking about how do we get off our devices? How do we get off social media? And, and one uh, lady said something that was very helpful. She said, you know, research on addiction shows it's not enough to just try and quit something. you got to replace it with something positive. You have to replace it. So if we try to get off social media so we can become better peacemakers and good at productive discourse, we have to replace that time with something that gives us a dopamine hit in our brain, gets us excited about life. And so we've got to look for those things. And that can be any number of things. It can be productive learning. It can be finding you know, long form reading. It can be all sorts of healthy habits. It can be exercise, maybe just sitting down with another human being and having a conversation instead of just scrolling endlessly on our phones, right? Yeah. And with that habit, number two, seeking real learning, I, I think the challenge for many of us is now our attention span is shrank due to overuse of social media. And it's hard to really sink into a lot of these subjects. So when you started the show, we're talking about complicated issues here that aren't going to be solved in a couple tweets or a storm or a short news article. But both sides have very strong arguments and beliefs wrapped up behind their viewpoint. So how do we actually seek the real learning that's going to allow us to figure out what either side is really thinking instead of the headlines and the clickbait that we see on social media? Well, I'll tell you what, one thing is so critical, you know, that that clickbait and those headlines have have increased, made us even dumber than we already are, right? So uh, I talk about in the first chapter, recognizing how little we actually know as human beings. And I mean, as as an individual. So, you know, there's research that shows humanity as a whole has gained an incredible amount of knowledge. It's just stunning. Any one of us is kind of an idiot, right? Like the three of us, the three of us are sitting here talking. I have absolutely no idea how this microphone is truly working and the, the data is getting transmitted to you back in real time. I mean, I have a sense of it, but when I really break down to what's happening with the electrons and the protons and what are the different materials involved and what are the regulations, the economic regulations, what is happening in space, when I start thinking about all that, I realize very quickly that my knowledge of what's happening right now is about zero percent. And that's true of most things in our world, 
But social media, we, we read a, a quick little meme of some silly quote from a politician we like or don't like. It gives us the illusion that we actually know more than we do. So the first thing is to recognize what you just said, which is everything we're getting on social media is probably valueless in terms of actually learning things. And uh, you know, to your point about we've got short attention spans, we have to retrain our brains to be able to focus longer. And long form reading is a really healthy way of doing that. I, I actually have tried to discipline myself now to make it a habit of my day to actually read books, physical books again, because my phone, my I realized my brain needed to be retrained. And so part of my habits is long form reading. And I, I mentioned that later in the book also, long form, long form reading isn't just good for real learning and retraining our brains. It's actually good for giving us an inner sense of peace. It lowers cortisol levels. It lowers stress levels. It helps us have a sense of inner peace, which then prepares us to have much more productive conversations about things rather than coming off five hours of a social media binge, being all worked up and upset because we read a bunch of things we didn't like and then going out there and arguing with somebody. <laughs> well, I know for a lot of our guests, we asked that they send physical books for exactly that reason. Because reading PDFs, I'm on my iPad, it's very easy to, to click over to something or a notification to pop up and all of a sudden I've lost where I was in the book and I couldn't actually digest exactly what I wanted to share with the audience in terms of the interview. So it's funny to hear that you are going to physical books. I think that is really a, a hack to get away from the devices, to soak in the learning that we need to do to become peacemakers and more well-informed on the subjects that we love to argue so much about. Well, I like what you just said, too, which is uh, it's important to emphasize. It's not just the social media companies that have mastered the art of keeping us addicted. That, that is the business model of every app and pretty much every smartphone that's out there, right? The more notices, the more they can keep your eyeballs on the device. So you think you're going to read a PDF, but they've got three notices coming in from four other apps all trying to get your attention. It makes it impossible, really. That doesn't happen with my hard my hardback books. <laughs> exactly. My dog-eared highlighted books. That's right. Let's talk about the first habit, because I think one thing that a lot of our listeners find in the other person when we're arguing is, is a lack of this habit. So how do we develop this habit and, and what is habit number one? So habit number one is kind of recognizing our own our own intellectual humility and then reframing conversations accordingly. And a really good habit to get into is what I just described. In any situation or about any topic, pause. It's, you have to get into the habit of pausing and asking yourself, what do I really know about this? I used to get, when I, in my younger years, before I figured this out, I would get into arguments with people about something like tax policy. At some point in my life, I realized I know absolutely nothing about tax policy. I'm like, I'm a law professor. I've got advanced degrees. I'm in an academic environment. I don't, I, I, I'm literally clueless, really, when I actually think about tax policy and precisely the effects of it. And, and so we need to get into the habit of recognizing how little we know, which then allows us to reframe conversations rather than trying to argue our, our viewpoint. We reframe conversations such that we're trying to learn more and we can reframe it with somebody we're talking about. You can say, well, you know, I actually am not quite sure I know enough about tax policy to give a really strong opinion here. So I'd like to understand it better. When somebody comes at you with a hard opinion and you throw that back at them, it'll force them to back up and, and lower their own tone. And then together you have a conversation where you're actually trying to learn things. You might actually look something up instead of just arguing with each other for an hour about what you think is the right way to go forward, right? Yeah, and we teach all of our clients in the X Factor Accelerator that curiosity is one of those traits that's really attractive and interesting and increases your likability. So if you come at it having already decided you know everything and built out your stance and you're not seeking any other information from the other side in that conversation to understand how they reach their opinion, which is different than yours, what they were reading, what they were consuming to get to that viewpoint, um, you're really defeating your own ability to become more likable and ultimately create the connection that we're all looking for. Yeah, I love it. I, I love what you guys do with these trainings and, and helping people understand some of these skills because it's so vital. I tell a story at the beginning of my book. It's one of my, it's one of my uh, funniest stories from my life where we I talk about how we get in a lot of trouble in life when we think we know about a lot about something and we don't. And for me, the story was when I was nine years old, I was going to a summer camp. And in my little town in New Mexico, it was really cool for boys like me to spike up our hair. So I went into our bathroom and I got the moose and I spiked up my hair and I was pretty proud of myself. And then I come walking out of the bathroom, my mom walks by and she starts sniffing and she's like, she says, what is that smell? And I very proudly pointed and say, it's the moose. 
And her eyes got big and she grabbed me. She spun me around, pushed me back into the bathroom and ran my head in the sink. And it turns out that what I thought was mousse was actually her hair removal product, Nair. And most of my hair started falling out within days, right? And uh, I, use, I, I use that as an example that in life, when we think we know a lot about something and we don't, we have strong opinions about it, we get in trouble. It's true for Nair and it's true about all of these hard topics. But to your point, you know, if you can just recognize how little you know and then want to learn from people you're talking with, it makes you more likable. It leads to more success in your relationships. And more importantly, I think it leads to a productive conversation about a hard topic rather than two people just spouting opinions to each other about something that deep down they probably don't know a lot about. And there are situations in conversation, small talk, meeting new people where maybe you don't have any experience or maybe you aren't as well read as them or maybe you haven't staked out any position. And we find oftentimes that our clients will feel awkward or try to avoid sharing that they don't know anything when in actuality, that's a superpower to be like, I want to learn from you. I'm actually curious to hear more about your opinion. I haven't experienced that. I haven't read that. I've, I've never seen or done that it actually isn't as dislikable as many people think. They think, oh, I need to share exactly what the other person is interested in in order to create that connection. But allowing the other person to share their thoughts and feelings and their views actually increases your likability. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I spent a lot of time with some very, very, very high level successful folks that, you know, people often be in awe of. They tend to be the most intellectually humble and curious in the room and are not afraid to just admit that they don't know something and they're kind of curious, you know, and that on the rare occasion, we'll all spout a strong opinion. They'll often follow up, not with a combative rhetorical question, but just, uh, you know, something that to kind of ask me, well, where did you get that from? Or where's your evidence for that? I'm curious. And then of course that puts me on the defensive. I got to be careful uh, at that point, but I can tell their attitude is not one of attack. They're genuinely wanting to learn more and know more, which, which I find very, uh, uh, very, you know, pleasant to be around. Yeah. And that links to a later habit being open to change, because many of us, if we aren't expressing that curiosity, then we're closing the door to any change in the future. I know Johnny and I laugh at some of our views over the history of this company, where we were thinking about certain arguments or issues has shifted and changed. And as we've gotten older, we've looked at it as one of the benefits of old age is learning how little we actually know. Right. And, you know, talking about wanting to have productive discourse is kind of meaningless if you're not open to change. I think the, the whole idea of making the discourse productive is that you actually get somewhere, right? And that suggests maybe a change of mind or at least a change of way you, how you think about something that is so critical and so important just to progress as an individual, but also for an organization or for society to progress. We have to be willing to think about things in a new way and change how we feel about them. You bring up a great point, and, and that's probably the most, the, the largest reason why uh, people don't want to get into those arguments or learn because they've already come to a conclusion about their position. And that conclusion encapsulates who they are, their identity, the, the decisions they made in life. And so if they find out that their, their actual leaning on that position is, is completely different, it does, that's a shock to their whole system that rocks them to their a lot of times to their core identity and i see it all the time in in um political discourse online i I see people who agree together but they can't agree on what the title of that thing is because they don't agree with the title but the actual position or what that actually means they're like oh I, i really enjoy that oh but because the other side uh, enjoys it or, or somebody that you don't agree with believes in that same thing or has that same position, it's difficult for you to, to get comfortable with it. And so that keeps people from having those conversations. How do you advise someone on that? My instinct is to tell people it can't be the case that every single issue on which you might change your mind should go all the way down to your core identity, right? Like, like we're talking about a lot of things that arguably should be a little more surface level than that. I talk in another place in my book about toxic tribalism, which I feel like, John, you hit on there a little bit, right? That this fear of stepping away from our tribe because our identity is so caught up in whatever tribe we're a part of, right? And that's that's toxic tribalism. Tribalism can be a good thing. You need a team and and teamwork can be helpful. You can get a lot done with a team and, and there can be positive tribalism, but this toxic tribalism where you're just terrified of abandoning your tribe on a particular issue 
is not healthy. Well, think about all of the indications of what that tribe means to you. It, it's a lot. And so to, uh, to get into trouble with that tribe uh, or to understand that you might be moving away from it is, is terrifying for a, a majority of, of folks. I myself, I love those challenges. I have my beliefs and, and ideas and positions on things have changed radically, just even in the last four years, just due to everything that we experienced since COVID. And I was excited to shed old beliefs for newer ones, only because they made me feel more confident, more powerful, more ideologically clean uh, than having certain contradictions that, that didn't allow me to feel that way in the past. So, but, but again, I was, I, I welcomed those changes and, and I was up for it. And, and it's part of my work. Like I, I love learning. So uh, those opportunities uh, don't come very often. And in fact, I was having this discussion with our X Factor members. Uh, it, a lot of people will chase whatever stimuli that they can as their, their drug. And maybe it's video games, maybe it is drugs, maybe it's gambling. But radical ideological shifts uh, or, uh, or massive identity shifts are also incredibly um, fun and, and, and come with a lot of endorphins and, and stimulus uh, in fact, I think that's why I, I, I choose intellectual pursuits. You know, I, ha- I do have a chapter where I talk about don't don't behave in a way that everyone fears. That's what you are, right? To kind of like don't validate other people's worst fears about you. But one of those things I think we often do too much is rejecting people when they change their view on something. You know, we kick them out of the tribe. That, what an unhealthy thing to do. So not only do we need to not be afraid of it the way you were talking, but I think we could all we could all do better at uh, when someone changes their mind maybe they suddenly disagree with us on something is not kicking them out of the tribe, but learning from them, asking how they reach that conclusion, not trying to argue with them right away and just figuring out, you know, letting them know we still love them. They're still our friends. It doesn't go to their core identity. They're still good people and we can still talk to them. It comes down to the three main mechanisms that, that we call value, which is attention, approval, and acceptance. So to have a, acceptance in your tribe is one thing, but also to have the approval of the decisions that you are making. Oh, my friends like the decisions are making. They're cool. They're supporting me. That's good. I guess I'm making the right decisions. One of the, one of the habits I talk about near the end of the book is it's okay to tell someone, even if you disagree with someone, it's okay to tell someone, you know, I can see how you got there. I can yeah. see how you reached the conclusion oh, you reached, right? And and it's re- seems reasonable, even mm-hmm. though I've reached a different conclusion. That's a great habit to get into because it's not it's not every t- everyone who disagrees with us is not a fool or a monster. Some people's decisions and and choices or the conclusions they've reached are within the realm of reasonableness. They're slightly different from our own, and we can say, "I can see how you got there." That that's a great habit. The rise of the toxic tribalism that you talk about, you know, media certain media companies have taken one side and then they've made caricatures of the other side to keep their tribe's attention, to keep viewership of their side active, engaged, and uh, embroiled in all of the rage baiting that goes on uh, on the media front. And unfortunately, in a lot of those situations, then we get into normal interactions with someone who might be on the other tribe and we default to those caricatures, we default to those negative views of the other side that are foisted on us by the media. And it does us a disservice to not actually realize that hey, there's a reasoned way that someone can reach a completely different conclusion than me on this issue, and that shouldn't mean sacrificing my friendship over it. It shouldn't mean sacrificing a relationship over it. But in in today's times, it feels like more and more we're comfortable to just retreat to our tribe and avoid anyone who happens to be from another tribe, even if they're a neighbor, even if they're a coworker, even if they're a friend, or even worse, a family member. You know, this is there's such a profit motive to pick a tribe and really push your tribe's view of things right now, right? Like there's a profit motive for these media companies you're talking about. We all know who they are. But there's a massive profit motive for authors and speakers as well, right? I often lament that like, just telling someone the other day, I'm going to make less money than many authors because I'm not willing to go out, pick a tribe, and then bombastically just offend that tribe no matter what. And I'm trying to do something different. And, you know, I'm going to I'm probably going to lose money because of it and sell fewer books, but I think it is so unhealthy. But that profit motive is there in the traditional media and that profit motive is there in social media because of the way it works. And so it's it's a difficult thing to combat. 
Yeah, and then you recognize the rise of grifters who don't even live up to what they espouse, don't even actually believe the tribal views that they write about, they advocate online simply because they're chasing the views, the clicks, and the engagement that leads to the financial gain. That's right. Well, one thing I, I want to talk a little bit more about is humor, because I think when we think about peacemaking, humor doesn't really come first to mind around how do we break through and have these important, difficult conversations where it seems like both sides are so wound up and humor being interjected might work against us. But you argue that actually understanding humor and using it to your advantage makes you an adept peacemaker. So how can we do that? How do we utilize humor? You know, I, I talk about this a lot in the chapter. I think it's absolutely critical. I often will start almost every large audience discussion with some kind of a humorous anecdote. I use the narrow one a lot because it's, you know, it, it drives the point home and it, it makes people kind of feel like, all right, this guy must not be that big of a monster. He's kind of a funny guy, self-deprecating. Um, the key, though, is to understand when it's appropriate and then the right kind of humor. So I go into my chapter on humor about the different kinds of humor. And I don't think there is a there are people who have a good sense of humor and people who don't. I think what we have is a world where there are different senses of humor. And it's important to kind of recognize where our strengths are, what, what our type of humor is, what type of humor other people appreciate, and then use it accordingly. I, I mentioned in the book, one personal anecdote is, I have a problem in that people I love and respect the most that I'm the most comfortable with, I often will do kind of a sarcastic, insulting humor towards them. And what I learned is I was burning friendships. I was ruining relationships because they didn't understand that I was trying, that that for me was a show of affection. I thought I was being funny. What I was actually doing was hurting their feelings. And then of course that made any type of productive and healthy discourse impossible. And it took me a lot of years to realize that. Once I did, I was like, okay, that kind of humor is not gonna cut it now. Although I did have one friend who's a beta reader who was a beta reader of the book, and he saw that section, and immediately now all of our discourse is biting humor towards one another because he's the same way, and we'd both been holding back, and now it's now we have a good time with it. But it was, but we had to recognize what humor worked for each of us, right? And if if I had if I had not realized that he appreciated that humor, I wouldn't I would have just refrained from using the biting humor and stuck to more, you know, Jerry Seinfeld esque uh, observational humor or something like that. Yeah, humor is one of those things where you get recommended a comedian by a friend and you recognize, oh, you, you have a different sense of humor than me. I don't find that comedian particularly funny, but you might thoroughly enjoy him and vice versa. But either way, I find that humor lowers the temperature. So we're talking about high charge situations where conflict, we're getting hot and bothered and frustrated. But if, if you can lower the temperature as a peacemaker and you can come in and interject a little humor and laughter first, so it allows everyone to cool off a little bit before getting into whatever it is that you want to say or whatever point you want to make, um, certainly creates a space where we're more open to new ideas than just charging right ahead with the point you want to make or the stories or the anecdotes that you think strengthen your position in a lot of these situations. And Johnny and I have unfortunately been in situations with mediators and, and lawyers, and, and we've always found the best mediators and lawyers are the ones who can use that humor to their advantage, can recognize when humor is the right move and what type of humor the other person enjoys to create that levity in these tense situations where we're trying to negotiate something fiercely to get our advantage across. Right, you know, and it's just so valuable. I was uh, I was thinking of a meeting as you were talking, and I was in it was in Des Moines, Iowa, at the World Food Bank Prize Hall, this beautiful building in Des Moines, and there was this big meeting talking about balancing religious liberty uh, interests with LGBTQ plus rights, and so it was a very diverse audience of of you know LG, LGBTQ plus advocates, atheists people of all sorts of different religions, different government leaders. Everyone's in this space. And there was a, a, a lady moderating a panel about one of these topics that could have gone sideways very quickly. She was masterful about saying a few jokes at the beginning, some self-deprecating, some kind of jokes that everyone in the room would appreciate, you know, it was kind of common to all of us in the space that by the time the dialogue actually started, kind of felt like, all right, we can actually say this without get, being at each other's throats. We can say our thoughts and feelings. She was very good at that. So the key, though, really is um, having some self-awareness. If you've got a humor that no one else appreciates, you've got to cut it out like my, like my kind of biting, sarcastic humor. And then uh, having awareness of other people and observing them and trying to get a sense of 
what type of humor will land with everybody? What type of humor does this person appreciate that maybe is specific to them and, and taking advantage of that? But, you know, that requires both self-awareness and awareness of people we're talking with. It's one of the things that we do in our X Factor class is getting the guys to be able to read the room and to see those subtle cues that are going to lead you to, to, to gather some information that, that will help you in that, in that, in that sense. Because conflict resolution, we need everybody on board. Uh, and we, and, and, uh, we want to make sure that everyone uh, shows up thinking that they're going to be leaving with a win and that with gr- a good conversation and open-mindedness and a willingness to work together, that everyone's leaving that room with a win. So we touched on a few of them. What are the five types of humor that we can employ? So, you know, different people, here's the thing, different people appreciate different types of humor. And it's really critical to know that, right? I mean, I love, I love like uh, the Jerry Seinfeld, Jim Gaffigan type of humor. And I'll show it, I'll be like dying laughing. And then I'll show a clip of it to somebody and they'll kind of look at me like that wasn't funny even a little bit, right? Um, We all have our different things. So there's the aggressive humor. Um, This is kind of similar to what I was talking about. That is my default, which is so funny because it's what I do when I really admire somebody and, and to burn bridges with people you really respect and admire is not is not a good move and yet that's this aggressive humor you'll often see it used by bullies so it's the kind of thing that you really better know who you're talking to if you're going to use that um there's the relatable humor and this is the type of humor i'm talking about with with a jerry seinfeld or a jim gaffigan or i I mentioned nate bargetzi right it's the kind of humor that hey we all have this in common um, this is, these are all everyday experiences we all appreciate, right? And, and we can kind of, we can kind of figure it out. Self-endearing humor. My Nair story is a good example of that, right? You're telling a silly story about yourself. That's a little bit self-deprecating, but it's not, it's not over the top. It's just enough to make people think, oh, this guy's kind of a, a charming, funny guy. I can get along with him, right? And then there's, there's self-deprecating humor, which you have to be careful with if you don't go, you don't want to go too far with it. Uh, because I don't know if you've ever, if you guys ever watched the office, but there's one where, uh, there's an episode where Michael Scott tries to engage in self-deprecating humor. And as traditional with that character, he goes too far and ends up just being incredibly awkward and painful. Right. Yeah. So be a little bit careful with self-deprecating humor. And then finally there's expressive humor. This one's a little bit difficult. It comes naturally to me. I don't know what happens to me when I get up in front of a crowd, but for some reason I just start making faces and doing gestures with my body that just make the crowd laugh, even when I don't intend for that to happen. But it's how you express things, right? And you can be up there, the audience will be expecting like a very serious topic, like, oh my gosh, we're talking about freedom of speech and protests with students. This is super serious. And you get up and you express something in just a certain way that just they were not expecting and it makes them laugh. That, that one's a little bit more natural. It's harder to learn, but it's, it's, it's your facial expressions. It's how you deliver a line, uh, that expressive humor that, that's really helpful. But folks can get on and they can read about these in the book and learn about maybe practice them out. I, I advise them to practice them before they're in front of a big audience, <laughs> maybe around family members or others and get a sense of how they, how they handle these things and figure out what's funny to them as well. Yeah, I think looking at the comedians that you find most entertaining and fun is a great way to sort of self-assess and then also sharing with others that you're learning more about humor. How would you describe me and my sense of humor could be really enlightening for you to see, hey, what is that superpower in terms of humor? Because for me, self-deprecation doesn't come naturally. I feel like I feel inauthentic expressing self-deprecating humor, but then I see comedians get up there and and just crush it with self-deprecation. So recognizing what is your sense of humor and playing to your strengths is better than mastering all five. I think that's right. And it really is important to recognize that there isn't, there isn't, like I said, there's not just two categories of people, those who are funny and those who are not. Everybody has it. We all know that person who is like one of the funniest people we ever meet. But everything they say is as dry as can possibly be, as it can possibly be. And if you're not careful, you don't realize that they're just dropping one joke after another, right? Uh, it's kind of just understanding that, being more aware of it, thinking about it as you interact with people, and then you can use it to your advantage uh, and hopefully to uh, increase productive dialogue in our society. Seems like so much of this is built off of a, a level of self awareness as a peacemaker. So understanding yourself at a deep level, your emotions, your thoughts, your communication style. And part of that includes being at inner peace, as you write about in the book. So really understanding that the more that we can calm our own inner turmoil, the more effective we're going to be in those situations of external turmoil. 
So how can we start to develop a deeper sense of inner peace to become peacemakers? Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but get off social media. <laughs> okay. I mean, step one. Right? Step one, get off social media, get off our phones, right? I, I mean, I, what I describe are all the things that I think most of us are aware of, but it's the, it's the building the habits into our lives. So it's taking time to journal, taking time to meditate or pray if you believe in prayer. Uh, both have been scientifically proven to be incredibly effective. Taking time to engage in what I call metacognition. So it's, or I don't call it, but that's what it is called. Um, it's a certain type of journaling, right? So you may have really strong emotions about something, a given situation. You're feeling something. It's probably a thought distortion. Taking the time to write down that thought and then writing all the evidence for it and all the evidence against it. That gets you out of your own thoughts. We've all had the experience where someone will come to us with a problem and we can give them brilliant advice, objective, brilliant advice. And then when we're dealing with the exact same problem or a similar one, we can't even, we can't think ourselves through it because we're so into the emotions, right? That act of writing it down has been proven to get our, get us out of our own heads and act almost as if it's called metacognition because you're getting outside of yourself and you're almost treating yourself like you're a third person and there you can really think through and gain a sense of peace about yourself. Uh, exercise is critical. You'll notice all of these things are things we cannot do on our phones, generally speaking, or on social media. So I, I hate to sound like that's you know the the root cause of all evil. I'm not trying to say that, but I but I do think we have to carve out time. For me, it's first thing I do every morning. It's quiet time and prayer, meditation, journaling, uh, reading before I start my day. And that helps me get grounded and focus on some of my own thought distortions and keep myself where I need to be. Yeah. And recognizing those distortions before you ruminate on them and they become days and weeks and months of you tangling yourself in those cognitive distortions, as, as Johnny says, I think it's so important to recognize that with contemplation, journaling, mindfulness, you can start to recognize some of the patterns that you have that allow you to feel safe, but might be harming you from your ability to see the other side, to be a peacemaker in your own life. That's right. And, you know, it's, all of those activities are the kind that then make you more aware of yourself, right? And that allows you then to be aware of what type of humor you like, what type of humor other people like, who you are as a person. It helps you identify those areas that perhaps you get too emotional about. We all have particular topics that we just get us worked up, right? taking the time to recognize what those are. And then I would recommend uh, to go back to long form reading, get a lot of books from different perspectives about these issues that get us so worked up and just read these books, spend more time with those topics that get us really upset. And the more time we spend with them, especially through not reading social media memes or hot YouTube videos, but actually reading long form books will help us be able to process them much better. Going along with that, spending time with people. So it's not that social media just takes us away from reading and contemplation and mindfulness, but it also takes us away from just having in-person interactions with people that we do disagree with, maybe with people we do agree with, but hearing how they came into agreement with us, just spending more time around people and getting more comfortable understanding the complexities of other people is important because so much of the message that we're receiving online and reading about, as I said earlier, is a caricature of other people. And it's easy to make those snap judgments about other people when you haven't really spent that much time around other people, when you spent more time in your head or only focused on the tidbits of information you're consuming online versus, you know, I can be in a heated political disagreement with my uncle and then the lions come on TV and it's Thanksgiving and we're having a great time again. And I don't hold any bad blood over what views he has or his position in an argument. But so many times we withdraw from those people that we disagree with. We avoid those people for tribalism reasons that we disagree with. And we never actually get a deeper understanding of what the other side thinks and feels and how they came to those beliefs. Yeah, you know, just spending time with people doing anything other than talking about hard topics <laughs> so that then you can talk about the hard topics, right? Just having fun with folks. I mentioned in the chat, I have a chapter, one of the habits is exactly that. And I mentioned that it's not my, um, it's not my best skill. I think it's the right advice, but it's not my best skill because one, I'm an introvert and two, uh, or I call myself a functional introvert. I can work a room and do anything with a, a group of people, but then I got to recover for a while by myself. So, so that's one problem I have. The other problem I have is I like talking about hard topics. There's a reason this is my profession and that I do it all day. I like thinking about these difficult problems. But what I realized is 
a lot of people don't want to just jump right into like, you know, what's the latest free speech debate or what's the latest religious liberty controversy, right? Um, I got to go spend time with people having fun, like you say, watching the Lions game, watching some college football, doing something we both enjoy together. Then when the conversations come, we can realize that both of us are real people with real problems, with real families who are just trying to do our best in this world. And then we can have a serious conversation about something and hopefully a productive one. Well, that brings up a great point that I'd love to hear your perspective on as you recognize these 10 habits. What are some habits that you really have to work towards yourself and be a little self-reflective on? That spending time with people is huge for me. I mentioned that already. And some of the research I, I built on in the book, there's a legal scholar named Derek Webb who did some great research into the formation of the United States Constitution. And, you know, we all know the Constitution had its flaws. It still has its flaws. It's a very controversial topic. But for the time, it's pretty miraculous that that thing was able to be written and adopted because the interests of the 13 colonies were so different from one another and they were all going to be at each other's throats. The benefit they had or the blessing they had was that they were all in this place where they were forced to kind of, there were only so many restaurants and there were only so many places they could sleep. And so they were forced to spend time together, kind of just hanging out outside of the environment where they were debating the provisions of the constitution. And it was that environment that allowed them to really start to realize that they had some common ground and could, and could achieve what they wanted to achieve. That just does not come naturally to me at all. I have to force myself to do it. I've got to go and just like, all right, I'm going to go hang out with my friends and we're just going to hang out. Don't bring up the latest controversy you're thinking about, right? Uh, that's one that I really, really have to work at. And then I think like anybody, I have certain topics that I get pretty emotional about and uh, that I that I've, you know, have strong opinions about, and I've had to recognize what those are. I I won't tell you what one of them is, but I'll tell you what I did about it. One time, someone said, well, I want your opinion about this particular topic that was in the news. And I get, you know, it's a topic I had strong feelings about. And I said, you know, I've reached a point that I've realized uh, it's best for me not to talk about that unless the person I'm talking to has at least done a minimum of, of some of the same readings I have. And, and if that person wants to give me some readings, then I'll come back and talk about it later. And I did this on a particular topic. I gave them a list of like 12 things I wanted them to read and watch. They gave me a list of things they wanted me to do. We both did it. And then when we came back, it was actually an amazing conversation that was incredibly productive. But I've had to, for certain topics, I've had to do that just to make sure I don't leap right in with my strong opinion about something. So going along with that, how do you seek the best argument against you? I know it's a habit that you espouse in the book, and I'm curious how you personally approach that. Yeah, you know, you have to hunt for the best arguments because oftentimes if you're talking with someone or reading someone with whom you disagree, they will have a hard time articulating the best argument against your position, right? So you've got to go look for uh, the most sophisticated sources. This requires, again, not just following whatever social media provides you, but uh, starting looking for uh, academics or sophisticated thinkers who who may have a different opinion than you do, and then reading some of their short work. I'm not unrealistic. I don't think we all have time to read long form books about every issue under the sun, right? We just don't, which is an important part of intellectual humility, realizing we can never learn everything that we would love to learn. But, but we can go read uh, an op ed from a sophisticated person who disagrees with us. One of, one of my more disappointing moments of the last year was um, my center here hosted an event. The scholar came, gave a really strong view about something, and I raised my hand and I said, it was in front of a bunch of students, I said, you know, there's a cost to everything. Um, we know that. Can you give us the most sophisticated argument against your position? doesn't mean it's a winning argument, but what is just the most sophisticated argument against your position? And the scholar said, well, there is none. There, just, there are no sophisticated arguments against my position. I was so disappointed in that answer. You know, like that's somebody who has not taken the time to even read a scholar in the field who hasn't even read other scholars who disagree with her on something. And it, it made it at that point much more difficult to take her seriously because I didn't feel like she'd done it. So it takes the effort of if I have a strong position about immigration, don't go running out and read everyone that I agree with. Don't go looking for memes on the Internet that make me feel good and, give, and confirm my bias. Go find a source that I know is opposed to me and then look for the most sophisticated thinkers. In the age of the internet, I think you can get to those people pretty quickly and read the strong arguments against your position. At a minimum, it'll strengthen your argument because you'll be able to respond to it mentally, but hopefully it'll help you understand more and more the nuances of what you're dealing with. 
Yeah, and I feel that that opens you up to other positions, even if you may not ultimately agree with them. But just being open to other positions is a powerful way to stay charming and, and in the skills that we teach our clients to be more relatable, which I think we could all use in, in this rise of polarization times. Right. So as we wrap, I'd love to hear what you would love our audience to take away from these 10 habits as they think about becoming peacemakers in their own life. You know, the, 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 I guess my most important thing I'd love for them to take away is that I did not mean for these 10 habits to be exhaustive, which is why I love a podcast like yours where you're training folks and all sorts of skills like this. I think my hope would be they would take these 10 habits, which are really actually 10 principles with a whole bunch of sub habits that I hope they can then employ in their lives, right? But then keep building on those, uh, you know, using training like what you all provide and, and observing others in their own lives and, and try to adopt even more habits that will help them engage in productive discourse. I think that is a, a critical skill. I hope these 10 will get people started. I think there's a lot more you could, you could employ. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and sharing these 10 with us and our audience. Where can they find out more about you in this book? Yeah, so the book's called Habits of a Peacemaker, launches September 3, 2024. Uh, anywhere books are sold, people can find it. They can go to my website, stephentcollis.com. It's available there as well. But uh, um, folks are welcome to reach out to me too. I'd love to hear from them. All right. Thank you for stopping by. Thanks to both of you. Thanks, David. 